Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my full review of the Canon RF 100mm f2.8 L IS USM, a high end macro lens designed for Canon's EOS R mirrorless system. While pitched as a macro lens for close up work, it's also a highly corrected short telephoto that will deliver great looking portraits and landscapes too. Like other RF lenses, it'll work on EOS R bodies with full or cropped frame sensors, but it is not compatible with EOS M bodies or Canon DSLRs. Launched in April 2021, it costs $13.99 US dollars or £14.49, but do look out for various cashback deals that, at the time I made this review, could knock around $100 or pounds off. As always, I have links below for the latest pricing. This latest 100mm macro lens comes almost 12 years after the EF version for DSLRs, seen here mounted on an EOS R5 using the EF to EOS R adapter, and at first glance they appear to share many specs, including the same focal length, aperture, the inclusion of optical stabilisation, USM focusing, and even the L branding. But while the EF model delivered a maximum magnification of 1 to 1 or 1 times, the newer RF version boasts 1.4 to 1 or 1.4 times magnification for greater reproduction, as well as an adjustable spherical aberration control for interesting soft focus effects I'll show you in just a moment. As a native RF lens it should also provide more reliable focusing as well as enhanced stabilisation. The older EF model has been creeping up in price, but it does remain a little bit cheaper at around $1,300 or £1,100, and it's still a very highly regarded lens. So the big question is whether the newer RF version is really that much better and deserving of its slightly higher asking price. To find out, I tested both lenses side by side on an EOS R5 body, and in this review I'll help you make the right choice. If you find my real life comparisons useful, please consider subscribing to my channel and do check out my other Canon RF lens reviews as I've tested almost all of them here. Oh and just to reconfirm, the EF macro lens that I've tested here was the high end f2.8 L model, so when I simply refer to it as the EF100 in this review, do know that I'm talking about the f2.8 L version. Ok so here's the old EF100 2.8 L macro on the left and the new RF100 2.8L macro on the right. And straight away you can see how the latter is longer, 148 versus 123mm, not to mention being 4mm wider, and at 685 grams it's also 60 grams heavier. But if you're adapting the EF version for use on an EOS R mirrorless camera, the combination actually will then weigh a little bit more and becomes essentially the same length. Overall, if you're adapting the EF lens for mirrorless, there's little to choose between them in terms of overall size and weight, but in terms of controls, they are actually quite different. So here's the RF100 2.8L mounted on an EOS R5, and starting from the mount on the right, there's three switches including a focus limiter with three ranges. Roughly midway along the barrel is the first big difference from the older EF model, and that's a dedicated SA ring to adjust the spherical aberration. A switch on the other side of the barrel locks it into the neutral position to avoid accidental use, but when unlocked you can smoothly turn it in a scale of plus or minus two steps, and now would seem as good a time as any to show you what it actually does in practice. So here's some video starting in the neutral position, before turning the ring slowly clockwise to the full negative setting. This is only adjusting the spherical aberration, not the actual focusing, and notice the effect it has not just on me, but the rendering in the background. And now gradually turning it back to the neutral position, before then continuing anti-clockwise to the full positive setting. While the subject and background rendering look different in this direction, it's clear to see how you can use this adjustment for a surreal in-camera dreamy effect. It's all very 1980s, isn't it? Would I use it personally? Probably not, and that's also coming from someone who previously owned the EF 135mm f2.8 soft focus lens, but you might love it, so do let me know in the comments what you think. Returning to the controls are a free spinning motor assisted manual focusing ring without any physical markings, and finally a clicky customizable RF control ring. At the end of the barrel is a 67mm filter thread, and here's how the lens looks when it's fitted with its supplied hood. For comparison, here's the old EF100 2.8L macro mounted on an EOS R5 using the EF to EOS R adapter. Once again, there's three control switches, including a focus limiter, with the same three options as the RF version, albeit not quite focusing as close. 
Meanwhile, there's just one ring on the EF lens, dedicated to manual focusing, and like other models of this era, it's mechanically linked with a small window indicating the actual focusing distance. In contrast, RF lenses with their motor-assisted manual focusing display the distance on screen or in the viewfinder. And finally, there's the same 67mm filter thread as the RF version, although interestingly the supplied hood is longer. As members of Canon's L-series, both lenses are sealed against dust and moisture with rubber grommets at their mounts. Note, due to their optical design, the RF100 macro is not compatible with teleconverters, whereas the EF version is. Both lenses will work with native extended tubes, but right now Canon only makes these in the EF mount. So if you want to use tubes with the RF lens, you'll need to go for third-party models designed for the RF mount, like those from Kenko. Okay, now for focusing, starting with the RF100 at f2.8 on an EOS R5 and in single autofocus mode using a central AF area. Here you can see the camera and lens snapping into focus almost instantly with no hesitation or overshooting, and this was with the full focusing range too. Now let's switch to the older EF100mm, opened again to f2.8 and adapted onto the EOS R5 using the same autofocus modes. This time the focus pulling back and forth is a tad slower, but I'd still say it's pretty swift and confident, certainly no complaints in this particular test. Note if either lens is struggling to lock onto a subject or overshoots, do try reducing the range with a focus limiter switch. Now for the same test but while filming 4K video on the R5, starting with the RF 100mm at f2.8. This time there was a little hesitation between each focus pull, but each was still performed smoothly and confidently without overshooting. Next for the older EF100 at 2.8, where again there's some hesitation between focus pulls, and I'd say the refocusing is also a little slower, but not in a detrimental way. Note the EF lens was very slightly audible while focusing, whereas the RF version was almost silent. Let's now try face tracking with the RF100 at f2.8 on the R5, allowing the camera to find me anywhere on the frame. There's a slight pause as I enter the frame, but once it locks onto me, the camera and lens combination keeps me in focus, at least while I'm facing them. Switching to the EF100 at f2.8 again starts with a brief pause before successfully tracking me as I move back and forth. Overall, I'd say the adapted EF lens is working well for video autofocus on the R5, although I did experience a little less consistency when shooting still portraits, as I'll show you in just a moment. But first for focus breathing, starting with the RF100 at f32, manually focusing from infinity to the closest distance, and back again. Now, since these lenses are designed to focus closer than non-macro models, you may be surprised by the amount of breathing that's visible here. But the RF is focusing down to 26 centimeters here where it can deliver that magnification of 1.4 times actual size. For comparison, here's the EF100 at F32, manually focusing from infinity to its closest focusing distance of 30 centimeters and back again. There's significant breathing again here, but notice how it continues breathing beyond where the newer RF lens stopped, even though the minimum distance on the EF lens isn't as close, and the maximum magnification at that point is also lower at one times actual size. I'll show you how they actually perform at their closest distances in just a moment. But first for stabilisation, starting with the RF100 filming video on the EOS R5, handheld with all stabilisation disabled. It's pretty wobbly, right? Flicking the switch on the side of the barrel activates the optical stabilization built into the lens, which works alongside the sensor shift IBIS in the R5, whether you like it or not. That's just the way Canon does it. As the system settles down, you can see it's possible to handhold video reasonably well, especially if you're less shaky than I am. And for comparison, here's the EF100, again starting with no stabilization, where it's pretty wobbly, before flicking the switch on the barrel to engage both the optical stabilization in the lens, as well as the sensor shift IBIS in the body. Again, Canon's system has both working together where they're both available. From these clips, I'd say the RF version might have a minor edge, but for video, the EF version really isn't far behind. Now for still photos, Canon claims five stops of stabilization from the optical system in the RF lens alone, or up to eight stops when combined with bodies featuring IBIS like the R5. So here's two shots taken with the RF100 on the EOS R5 at the same shutter speed of 13th of a second, on the left with optical and IBIS enabled, and on the right without any stabilization. 
Now, 13th of a second was the slowest shutter speed that I could handhold for a perfectly sharp result with stabilization enabled. And to match that result without any stabilization on the day required a shutter speed of 200th of a second. So that works out at about four stops of compensation. And for comparison, here's two shots taken with the EF100 on the EOS R5, again on the left with optical and IBIS, and on the right without any stabilization, but this time at the shutter speed of one sixth of a second. On the day, this was the slowest speed I could handhold a sharp result with all stabilization enabled, which actually works out at five stops of compensation in total, making the older lens a stop better than the previous result that I got from the RF lens. Now, the effectiveness of different stabilization systems can vary between people and situations, but from this single test, the newer RF lens certainly didn't take the lead that I expected from Canon's specs and actually worked out a little bit worse on the day. Of course, your mileage will almost certainly vary, but I'd love to hear the kind of results that you're getting if you're using these lenses. Okay, next for my optical quality test, starting with my standard distant landscape view of Brighton Pier, angled so that fine details run into the corners. You're looking at the RF100 f2.8L here on the EOS R5 with the aperture wide open at f2.8. Taking a closer look in the middle reveals very high sharpness and contrast with a tremendous amount of detail right out the gate. And when I stop the lens down, there's little to no benefit in terms of sharpness from this distance, proving that this lens is already performing very well at its maximum aperture. For comparison, here's a close look at the RF100 2.8L on the left and the older EF100 f2.8 L on the right, both at their maximum apertures of f2.8, where you can see the newer RF version on the left is delivering a crisper result with higher contrast. Now, if you were to view the EF version in isolation, it still looks pretty good, but the newer RF model is simply outperforming it at their maximum apertures, as indeed you should expect for a lens that's over a decade newer. As you close the apertures on both lenses, the older EF version enjoys a boost in contrast and ultimate detail, at this point coming very close to the RF model when close to f5.6 and especially by f8. So while the RF lens is a clear leader when wide open at f2.8, if you can close your lenses down, there's actually little to choose between them at this point. Returning to the f2.8 sample and heading into the corner tells much the same story. The newer RF lens on the left remains very crisp, while the older EF version on the right shows a little softness, but is still delivering a great result. It's just that the newer optics are even better. Closing down the aperture on the RF lens again makes little difference to the overall contrast and sharpness, but it does provide improvements to the EF image, which again by F5.6 and F8 becomes very close to the newer RF model. It's also impressive how little vignetting there was in the corner of either lens, even wide open. As for coverage, both lenses are almost identical, as their quoted focal lens would suggest, although as noted earlier, the older EF lens has the benefit of being able to work with teleconverters to extend the reach, whereas the newer RF version can't do that. Okay, now let's look at portraits, starting with the RF100 at f2.8 and using eye detection on the R5 to autofocus. Telephoto macros actually make great portrait lenses with flattering focal lengths, bright apertures for blurry backgrounds, and generally very well corrected optics. And the RF100 is no exception, delivering razor sharp details around my eyes. Like other native RF lenses on EOS R bodies, the eye detection autofocus also proves very consistent and reliable. Meanwhile, the background rendering is nice and smooth, and while you won't get the ultimate blurring of a brighter aperture telephoto lens, it's still pretty attractive and not at all distracting. Placing the RF100 on the left and the EF100 on the right, both from the same distance and both wide open at f2.8, shows once again that the older EF version, or at least my sample of it, looks a little soft in comparison. I reshot the EF portrait multiple times using different AF modes and in manual focus too, but this was the best result. Again, when viewed in isolation, it's not bad at all, but the newer RF lens was simply sharper in my tests and more consistent with autofocus too. Close both lenses to F4 though, and my EF sample improved a great deal, coming very close to the crispness of the newer RF model. And as for the background rendering, both lenses shared a pretty similar style in this test. To better evaluate their bokeh, I photographed this ornament against LED fairy lights at each of their apertures. Here's the RF100 at f2.8, and now here's the EF100, also at f2.8. 
Placing them side by side shows both share a lot of the same rendering characteristics, with well-behaved bokeh blobs blacking the distracting onion ring textures or outlines of lesser lenses. As the blobs become less circular towards the edges though, notice how their asymmetric shapes become flipped in relation to each other. It's not a problem, just an observation. As you close the aperture down on both lenses, the shapes become more uniformly circular across the frame, albeit influenced by their respective aperture blade systems. I don't personally have a preference between them here, do you? Which finally brings me to the most important aspect of any macro lens, and that's of course the close-up performance, especially at the minimum focusing distance. To measure their maximum reproduction without any accessories, I photographed a ruler as close as both lenses would focus, and this time I'm starting with the EF100 at its closest focusing distance of around 30 centimeters, where it's capturing a subject width of 36 millimeters on a full frame EOS R5, and this confirms its true one-to-one -one reproduction capabilities or one times magnification. This is an actual size. But now here's the RF100 from its closest focusing distance of around 26 centimeters, where it's capturing a smaller subject width of 25 millimeters on a full frame R5, and that confirms its greater 1.4 to 1 reproduction or 1.4 times magnification. So that's comfortably greater than actual size. Now, greater reproduction is always desirable for macro enthusiasts, and this is the major benefit of the newer RF lens over its predecessor, although I should note that the EF100 can achieve 1.37 times magnification when you couple it with the optional EF25 Mark II extension tube accessory. You could, of course, also use extension tubes on the RF lens, but Canon doesn't make any yet in the native RF mount, so you'd need to go with third parties like Kenko. To compare their quality at 1 to 1 magnification, I photographed a UK pound coin which measures approximately 23mm between points, thereby almost filling the vertical height of a full frame sensor at 1 times magnification. So here you're looking at the full height of the photo, uncropped, starting with the RF100, before switching to the EF100 version and I shot both of these at f5.6. Placing them side by side shows a very similar degree of fine detail when shot with the aperture closed down. Looking closer perhaps reveals the RF version on the left to be a tad crisper, but there's really barely anything in it for an unstacked macro shot at 1 to 1 with the apertures closed for the maximum effect. But the RF lens can deliver great reproduction without accessories, so before moving on, here's the coin with the RF100 on the left and the EF100 on the right, both operating at their maximum magnifications of 1.4 times and 1 times respectively. Do note that the RF100 lens does appear to suffer a little from focus shifting when operating at very close range, where the plane of focus can shift a tad backwards as you close the aperture. Now, this wasn't an issue in most of my tests, but I did want to mention it here. Next, here's a sequence of 100 images that I shot with the RF100 at f4 using focus bracketing on the R5 to finally adjust the focus on each shot. The goal here is to use stacking software afterwards to combine all the images into a single image file where more or even all of the subject can become completely sharp. Focus stacking is a popular technique used by macro photographers and Canon claims to have reduced the breathing on the RF lens compared to the EF version to make that process easier, but you can still see a magnification change here as the camera focuses from one side of the coin to the other. And here's the final result with 100 frames assembled using Helicon focus software and that's available for Macs and PCs and using the default render settings. The total depth of field here is far greater than you could achieve even with the aperture closed to f32 and by shooting each frame at larger apertures like f4 you'll also avoid the softening effect of diffraction. Helicon has also dealt with the magnification change due to any breathing. Here's another example showing the focus stacking process in action. I'd highly recommend giving it a try if your camera has focus bracketing capabilities and Helicon Focus has always produced great results for me. There's a free trial on their website if you want to give it a shot. And now it's time for my final verdict during which I'll show you a selection of images taken with the RF100 macro on an EOS R5. As always you can access original versions of many of my sample images via my reviews at cameralabs.com if you'd like a closer look. For many years, the EF100 2.8L macro was the close-up lens that Canon owners aspired to, delivering excellent results both near and far. It's a tough act to follow, but the RF100 2.8L macro outperforms it in a number of key respects. Most obviously, it'll deliver great reproduction without the use of accessories, with a maximum magnification of 1.4 times versus 1 times on the older EF model. 
While both lenses shared similar sharpness when closed down a little, the newer RF model was noticeably crisper than my own EF sample when both were wide open at f2.8, and it also worked more reliably with eye detection autofocus on EOS R bodies, and that makes it the preferred choice for portrait work too. Autofocusing was a little faster, quieter, and more confident overall on the RF lens, although do be aware of potential focus shift as the aperture is adjusted when shooting at very close range. Meanwhile, that spherical aberration adjustment ring may be a little gimmicky, but can still be fun for generating soft focus results. Besides, the 80s are back in fashion, right? In my own test, the stabilisation coupled with the R5 didn't meet Canon's claims, and interestingly, the older EF version actually performed a little better in this regard on the day, but your mileage will almost certainly vary. In addition, the EF lens is compatible with teleconverters, whereas the RF version is not. And while both lenses can work with extension tubes for greater magnification, Canon doesn't yet make any in the RF fit. Although to be fair, third-party RF tubes are available. Ultimately, the pros outweigh any cons for me personally, making the RF 100mm f2.8 L the best overall macro lens I've tested for any Canon camera. As prices have crept up on the older EF version, the new model doesn't command much of a premium over it either, so I'd highly recommend the RF100 if you can stretch to its price. Meanwhile, EOS R owners on a tighter budget should consider the more affordable Canon RF 35mm 1.8 macro, and we can all collectively hope that Sigma makes an RF version of their excellent 105mm 2.8 DGDN macro sooner rather than later. And that's it for another lens review. Do let me know what you think and which is your favourite macro lens in the comments. If you found my review useful, please do consider giving it a like and my channel a follow, or how about treating yourself to a Camera Labs t-shirt or my in-camera photography book. And if you're feeling extra generous, I'm always up for a coffee. Links for everything below as always. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.